Okay, so my clock now says it's 10 past three. So here we go. Um, yeah, my talk is about DVD9 and how we connect to OpenStack. Um, let me jump right into the topic with um, looking back for, for a few minutes. So um, this is an illustration that, um, that shows how DVD8 works. Uh, and we will go through that so that you can easily follow me when we go to what is DVD9 actually doing. So what we have been doing for the last 14 years is we built HA systems and we really focus on the storage part of HA systems. So those, those two orange boxes um, illustrate the Linux kernel and in that we have a so-called IO stack, that's this page cache file system DBD thing, and we have a network stack. And in the IO stack we can insert certain, uh, certain things and certain places and there where you see this um, DVD box, this is exactly the same place where things like LVM hook in, where software aid goes in, and so on. So now DVD mirrors all the writes it gets in, so it sends it over the network to the other node. It, uh, each and every write is written on the other node, an acknowledgement goes back, and only if we have both technologies, you know, that from the local disk and that from the remote side, we send it up um, to the application above us. So that's synchronous mirroring. We not only do that, we also do asynchronous mirroring. And, you know, that doesn't happen one after one request. In a, in a real system, you have here hundreds or thousands of these operations going on at the same time, or hundred thousands. Okay, so um, the, the basic property is here. In, in case anything fails in such a cluster, and you know, we are only concerned about, uh, concerned about things that fail and how we can recover from that. So if a node fails and comes back later on, DBD will resync up all the writes that were, are missing on the, on the previously failed nodes. It finds out about that it has to do a resync, it finds about uh, the direction, which blocks it needs to sync up. Uh, all that without that anybody has to care about it. Um, we're quite proud about our performance. So this 160K ops we measured on a system that was packed with uh, reasonable SSDs and um, reasonable, reasonable networking in between. You can't do that with your one gig link, right? Um, yeah, we do multiple volumes per resource. That means, um, well, well, that's better known as consistency groups. Uh, you need that when you have, you know, <clears throat> an application like a database using two different types of storage. Uh, imagine your database uh, uses an SSDs where you put your logs uh, and you have RAID 5 where you put the table spaces. If you mirror such, such a setup, you want to mirror those, both, bo uh, those two volumes yeah, as one logical group because you cannot recover if replication fails for one of those two. Um, yeah, we have pacemaker integration. We, we do that uh, locally and over the van, even over the internet if you like. Uh, oh, yeah, and we were Linux upstream since 2009. It was released 2010. So this is the old stuff. Um, if I want one thing, what you take from this presentation is DVD9 has four new features. And if you really are eager to learn something, then try to rem remember the four features. <laughs> okay, we can now do 32 nodes so we can copy your data 31 times, if you like. I mean, who of you wants to have 32 copies of his block data? Right, me neither. Oh, oh yeah, we have one gentleman, perfect. <laughs> okay, 
The other important feature, auto promote. I will come to that in a second. Uh, this is more like an agenda slide. Then we have this transport abstraction layer. That means we got R uh, RTMA support. Very cool. I will come to that. And the fourth uh, feature, DVD manage. I will also come to that. So four. Just remember the number four. <laughs> OK, auto promote. What's that? Uh, so for those of you who have already used DVD, I, I'm assume that's not too many in this crowd. OK. It's a few. <laughs> so before it was like, like on the left side of the slide, you have, at first you have to use an explicit command to promote the device on this node. And after that, you were able to use it. And after using it, uh, you have to demote it before you can promote it somewhere else. Um, now in DBD9, we got this feature auto promote. And that works that way. You open it for read write access. And in the very moment, it, it promotes itself to primary. If you try that on the next node, you open it for read-write access, and boom, you get an error node back, because it's already promoted. So I wonder why we didn't come up with that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The promotion process? Yeah. Well, um, it's in. Yeah, it's in milliseconds, whatever. It, it depends on two round trips. So it, it's basically a two-phase commit. You have to execute over all the nodes. So if you have nice networking equipment, you will not notice it. Um, yeah, that was easy to explain. Now, um, the network abstraction, yeah. So. Up to now, we had this TCP transport built right into DOBD. That meant we only were capable of using TCP to communi communicate between the two nodes. Now we abstracted it out. Now we have transport modules you can load on the fly. You can load one or multiple of those. And here we see the options. So with the TCP module, you usually use TCP software implemented in a Linux kernel on top of IP, and then you use Ethernet cards, which use an Ethernet switch, and so on. So that's, everybody knows that. So then, then there is this RDMA side, the green stuff. The, that's the new one. And RDMA, that's, that's interesting, because it's really a new API, and that allows you to, um, to saturate pipes of 50 gigabits or even 100 gigabits. The old API, the TCP API, the, the problem lies in the API. So, so that's cool. We're re really proud about it. Um, yeah, and the hardware you usually use are uh, adapter cards from, well, which do either directly InfiniBand or you can uh, have this rock key standard. So that means you have those new cards, those, this new API, and then you use switches you already know because nobody likes to learn about new InfiniBand switches, right? It took years until you understood VLANs and all that stuff, and suddenly, why should I use new switches? OK, then <clears throat> also iWARP is an interesting option. Um, here on, on an iWARP card, you have a complete TCP stack in, on a network card, in the firmware on this card. So you get the new API, which is very performant, and you can run it over the internet, which means you need a 100 gig, bit, uh, 100 gig internet connection. Who has one? <laughs> OK, somebody will. Um, yeah, so I think that's also easy to get. Then um, that was new feature number three. Now we're coming to f new feature number four. Uh, that's uh, DVD managed. So, um, how s so far, so for the la last 10 years, it was like that. Um, DVD is, is a driver that lives in a Linux kernel, and it is a virtual driver. So, you, you need to configure it. You need to tell it what it should do. You need to tell it, okay, mirror this disk and use this IP address and so on. So, there's a small user space tool, DVD setup. 
you, it has ugly long command lines. Nobody wants to use that. You give all the information on the command lines. Well, so that, that anybody can use it, we have this tool called DBDADM that reads uh, config files that are written in a declarative way. You copy this config file to all the nodes that are part of your setup, and then you use this command and get it configured. Now, um, OpenStack is about automation, right? So let's put some automation on top of that. Um, here it is. So <clears throat> DBD Manage is a daemon on top of that. Uh, it can spit out config files on your nodes. It can create the logic volumes where your data lives, which you re replicate. It does that for you. And it has a DBus interface to a, to a uh, um, CLI tool. So pretty easy, right? Um, so uh, what you need to use it is a few nodes with storage in a volume group. So this is your part, your preparation. Um, and what you get out of it is you can request replicated resources by simply giving a name, a size, and a replica count. And it will take care of the rest. So it will find nodes where there's enough space. It will create the LV and will put the config files there, initialize DVD metadata, and all that stuff. OK, so here I have an illustration that shows the software architecture of DVD Manage. So we have the, the command line interface at the top. That's easy. You call that on the, on the shell. That uses dbursts to, to connect to a lo locally running daemon. And that daemon writes things it thinks they're important to a control volume. So what is the control volume? That's a rather small volume TFD to Manage will create on your nodes. It's about 4 megabyte in size. And when it writes there, you know, it, it does it open. Open leads to an auto-promote, so it gets primary. It can write the data, and when it's finished, it closes it again. It becomes secondary again. The other nodes have this DVD event journal. So the daemon on the other nodes gets notified, oh, somebody else wrote to it, so maybe I read it. So, so this is a replicated database. <laughs> well, a very simple one. Uh, and, and DVD-9 itself is used to replicate this configuration and as communication channel at the same time. So this is this eat your own dog food strategy, right? OK, so this, um, this illustration shows how you can imagine that with real volumes and real servers. So that should be four servers. On each, you have this control volume. It's mirrored over all of them. And then you have user volumes, and usually, well, most of them are two ways redundant. You can have volumes that are three ways redundant, and so on. Um, when you add a new node, you can do things like rebalance it, you know, increase the replica count of D, and afterwards remove it from another node to uh, create bigger chunks of free space. Um, you can use the new space, and so on. Um, one thing to mention here, unfortunately I don't have an animation for that. Um, when, you, when you lose a node, when it goes down, DVD Manage does nothing, because all the data is available. Um, and it, it needs outside knowledge. Will this node ever come back, or is it gone forever? And in case it's gone forever, you just simply tell it, DVD manage, remove node, rebalance. And that means that all the replicas that were lost are reallocated on, on the remaining nodes. Uh, but it cannot know by itself if the node will eventually come back or not. So this is outside information you need to provide. So it is a provisioning solution for DBD. We have implemented that in Python. It manages LVs and so on. 
Yeah, it also does snapshotting for you, if you like. Um, if, if you want that it can do snapshots, it will create all the LVs in a thinly provisioned pools, so thin LV. Um, yeah, when, when you create snapshots, you can also give replica counts with the snapshot so that you don't lose the snapshot, blah, blah. Um, yeah, and right now we scale to 32 nodes, uh, but we, we have it in the design, in the current code, that we will scale up to many no more nodes. So how we will do that? Um, we will add a concept we call satellite nodes. So simply speaking, you can have this replicated config database only on those 32, but those 32 themselves can manage more nodes. So on, on, on the satellite nodes, you will have only user data, not the control volume. And with that, we expect and we can scale like crazy. Um, yeah, but that's on a roadmap. Okay, so far the foundation. Now, how hard is it to bring that to Cinder? I think not that hard. So we are at the OpenStack Summit. I'm not going to explain that, right? Um, so we had this, this illustration of the control pane. So, so here the change is easy. <clears throat> you no longer use a command line client. It's connected by a Cinder driver. That means you create your volumes in the Horizon dashboard. You configure there a few pools like two ways mirrored, three ways mirrored, or things like two ways mirrored in my, data cent in my main data center with one offsite replica asynchronously on the other end of the world. And then the user just selects from the, from the pool. And yeah, and we do a, an estimation of how much space is available in, in your pools. Think about, of, at a, or about that for a second, <laughs> how exact that could be. Um, yeah, and then everything happens in the background. So you no longer need to fiddle with DVDs, config files, or anything of that. Um, yeah. Um, Noah, right. Um, when you create Cinder volumes, you usually want to do something with that. So you usually want to attach that to virtual machines, right? So. <clears throat> Um, if, the, if the Nova, well, if you have a, a converged cluster where you use the same nodes for compute and storage, um, and our driver finds out of that, that Nova decided to start a virtual machine where we actually have a replica of the data, that's easy. The data is there. No ice cousin needed, no blah, blah, blah. Um, in case Nova decides to start the VM on a machine where we do not have a a replica, we can use the DBD protocol itself for accessing the storage. Yeah? So you do not need to layer iSCSI on top of that. And that has a few little advantages, like, um, like um, when we have two nodes with storage, you know, we can go to both to read the data. So read balancing. Um, well, when writing, we have to write to both, obviously. Yeah, so ideally, we want to, to make Nova a bit more clever to take hints from our system. Uh, we're not yet there, but this is an open source project, so eventually, in a few years. Or sooner, if someone decides to help us. Um, okay, so when you, when you talk about storage in OpenStack, you always get different ideas, right? Um, so, some players f think it's a good idea to put all the storage in, in expensive storage boxes. You connect to your compute nodes by a SAN that probably is not managed by any of, of the existing software drivers, which are part of Nova. So it looks something uh, or similar to that. So where we are obviously going looks like that. 
So we want to, to use simply more boxes of the same kind with storage. And you have an Ethernet or the network of your choice connecting your compute nodes and your storage nodes. And it's clear what the next step is. Just converge the thing. You know, use one kind of nodes, have local storage in those nodes, and have Nova and Zinder managing this set in an over overlapping way. Yeah. Okay. Um, did I mention that DBD is open source? <laughs> okay, so go get it. Try it out. Um, DBD9 is right now in its, um, in its release candidate phase. So we, we, exp no, we have scheduled that the final release will happen in five weeks from now. So mid-June. Um, the release candidates are in pretty good shape. Um, you can get the source code from here. You can get access to RPM uh, repositories if you shoot us a message. Um, we are also a business. So you can get support from us, um, the usual open source business model. Um, yeah, any questions? Um, uh, could, could you use the mic? Yeah, otherwise, I have to repeat the question. <laughs> so I have two questions. Uh, one is related to the largest capacity that you deployed. Um, um, it was a 50 terabyte volume that was the largest uh, single volume capacity. And to give more context, um, our code currently has a limit at one petabyte okay. for a single volume. Okay. In terms of upgrade, is it going to be a smooth cycle? How do you envision the upgrade from A3 to 9 version? Um, sorry. Like I the upgrade cycle? Like, you know, when you have to upgrade, let's say you have version A3 now running? The upgrade. Oh, the upgrade. Now I got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, the upgrade path is pretty smooth. Um, the, the DVD metadata on disk, that changed, and you can convert that. Um, and the protocol, you know, it, if DVD 9 finds out, oh, the other guy is DVD 8.4, it switches back to DVD 8.4 mode on a protocol level. So you can actually do really a rolling upgrade. Um, we are in HA. Our ex customers expect that from us. Uh, yes, I, I just want to make sure I understand something. So you can have currently you can have 32 nodes in your cluster, and you I would do LVM on these, and uh, each volume that I create then can be I have a, I can decide how I uh, how, what my replica number of replicas is going to be and then the system will distribute this uh, itself exactly right yes. and and each volume then can be you said can be one petabyte so uh, how would yeah I mean th th that's the limit each of those could be one petabyte like a could be one petabyte so that that of course requires that on each system I at least have one petabyte LVM, right? Okay, <laughs> just just trying to make sure I, I mean, understand that, this. Th that's our limit, yeah. Yeah, you, know, you could fine. deploy smaller nodes as well. Right, but it's, <laughs> the, it's not like it would get striped across, and I could like have a volume as larger than one my single one single node. Yeah, something. now yeah. I understand where the question is going. Yeah. No, we we don't we cannot stripe it out right now. Right. Um, we. So, if, uh, so sorry. my question is, well, if, if like your volumes look like set pools and your replica sets, you know, I mean, it looks like this would compete with Ceph, trying to understand if, if this, is that your point of view too, or? I mean, um, you can put DBD on anything that's a block device. Right. So if you like, you can put it on, on RBD, on Rados block devices. No, 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 I'm saying this would replace that, right? No? Is it computing mm, technology? Yes, you can. If, if you use Ceph to get block out of it, this is a perfect right. replacement. If you use Ceph to get object out of it, 
Well, their this object is, not is on replacement. top of their block anyway, so if they can do it, you can do it. You can put a Rados gateway on top of this, right? So, I mean. Sure. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, excuse me. One more thing. Uh, 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 one flip, please use the mic. So if block device A is one petabyte and block device E is one petabyte, you can have one virtual machine accessing, does it work? You can have one virtual machine accessing both of them, just like two hard disks, and then do LVM or something like that on top so that you can do a two petabyte logical volume in the virtual machine, for example. So, um, Philip, um, I mean, in cloud, we talk a lot about scale out storage, and Ceph is a popular uh, open source solution for that. If you compare your solution to, for example, Ceph, um, what would be the application scenarios where you say, well, scale out is a good, a better approach? And where would you say, well, this is the strength where DRBD really shines and where you would advise mm -hmm. people to use such a more classical um, mm -hmm. host based mm -hmm. mirroring technology? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Ceph shines when you need block storage, object storage, and maybe file storage from a single pool. I mean, that's, that's really the awesome feature of Ceph. Um, where we really shine is if you have fast storage and you expect that after your software-defined storage layer, you still get performance. This is where this shines. So our whole uh, data plane, that's in kernel. And, you know, we don't copy it around. If, if you use RDMA, that's, I mean, we are really proud of the performance we get out of that. All our customers who drive the, the development of our technology ask for performance, performance, and for performance. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Please. Uh, uh, I have a question. So you just mentioned a performance. Is there any performance number? <laughs> performance numbers? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so, so with, with, RDMA, uh, with an RDMA interconnect network, uh, the best thing I, I saw was uh, that we have a write throughput of a full all random write pattern, 4K. Mm -hmm. A throughput of 2.2 uh, giga gigabytes per second. Uh, oh. But that was a machine crazily loaded with SSDs, sorry, a pair of machines. Uh, so uh, this is a full SSD uh, setup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, w when we have hard disks, the hard disks are so slow. Those numbers are boring, right? <laughs> um. With the converged model you talked about, compute and storage all in one box, so um, with what you've talked about, you know, I can scale to 32 compute nodes with storage, so, so how, do I, you know, how do I mix your synchronous, asynchronous model to go like, let's say, to 250 compute nodes in the same converged model? Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a slide on that, but um, just imagine you add here more and more and more nodes going beyond the 32 limit, and these additional nodes don't have a DOBD control volume, okay? And the whole setup works as long as one of your nodes that has a control volume survives. Only one is needed. So the idea is you have your many thousand nodes and put one node with control volume in each of those racks. And you need one of them to survive, and the whole system will survive. So this is the idea. Yeah, I really need to draw a picture of that. OK. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, uh, please. So uh, DRBD only provides the volume data replication, correct? So uh, does it also provide uh, volume management, like a snapshot or clone. Uh, as you just mentioned in the slides, it seems that it uh, leveraged uh, LVM to, to 
to provide uh, snapshots. Is it correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the answer is we use LVM to snapshot the volume, mm -hmm. but the management of that, you know, is in this DBD manage thing in, in the daemon and database and so on. So, so you, you tell it, oh, I have a three ways replicated volume, create me a snapshot, and the snapshot has to exist in two volumes, uh, two nodes, yeah. So, so it's managed in the system. So from, from the point of, of user, it is like, you know, the whole system can do, do snapshots. And as with the volume, you can also say, give for the snapshot the replica count. In other words, how important is it? Yeah, then um, how does it do uh, volume clone? Does the cop did it copy or can do anything clone? So how to clone a, a volume? Just the DD? Uh, so, so how, how we do how we clone a volume if yeah. if we want to if we turn a snapshot into a volume again? Yeah. Oh, oh, just a clone a volume uh, from a volume. Yeah. Yeah. So so we use this thin LV on the nodes, uh, thin yeah. L, thin LVM, and that does the, all the tricks on on the on the nodes. So okay. So the, so the straight answer is. Yes, it does that in an efficient way. We don't use DD for that. Yeah. That all the magic is in thin, L, uh, thin LVM snapshots and our management on top of that, and DVD is the replication part. Okay. 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 I'm back. So, <laughs> um, what happens if you have, let's say, a thousand VMs? a terabyte volume, and they're all right. So from the concurrency right perspective, did you test it a large environment where you have lots of concurrent rights to ensure that you have no blocking, you know, no, nothing with the scheduling, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if we have here many, many nodes and thousand volumes with thousand, VMs. thousand VMs or even 2,000 volumes and 1,000 VMs consuming those 2,000 volumes. It's, it's pretty distributed, you know. A VM, a VM writing here in the, in the whole data pa path, there is only communication between the node where you issue the write and your standby machine. Nobody else in the cluster is involved in the data path. So during, during I.O., there is very little contention. Uh, the only point where you have contention is when you do management commands. So I don't think we will be able to create, you know, 20, 20 volumes a second. Um, I, I don't have numbers on that. but. This is where the limits are, and I hope you can live with that. <laughs> Just wondering, um, in DRBD8, I had ended up briefly using the active app, active mode with OCFS on, on, on top of that. Have you tested that on DRBD9? Does it work out well? <laughs> the, <clears throat> the dual primary, the active active mode, is still there. Uh, so far, we haven't worked on, uh, to scale that. So you can have only two primaries and 30 secondaries. Um, so that is all still there. Um, it is tested as we head to our release. Um, so that's still there. But I think the dual primary mode, the active active mode, has not that many use cases. I know people always ask for it. So what's your use case for using active active mode? Uh, what I actually ended up doing as a hack on top of things was key value store into um, a massive primary system. So. Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> a real use case. <laughs> so you, usually people come up with things like, oh, I put cluster and LVM on top of it, and then I have logic volumes here and there. And that's actually stupid, because it's better to use the, you know, 
to outsource all that into DoD Manage. Uh, but if you have a distributed key value store, dual primary mode is cool. More primaries would be useful. <laughs> If <laughs> we, we accept customers. <laughs> okay, do I have time left? Five minutes. Okay, so if the questions are exhausted, well, I can really, I can actually fire up a few VMs and try it out. Um, didn't do a lot of testing on that, so so please please don't grill me if it fails. Okay, there's a terminal. Um, here's my mouse. Let's change the colors. Is it better? Yeah. Look at that. Okay, that, that will fire up 10 virtual machines on, on my laptop. Um, you cannot see the CPU utilization thing that's on my side of the screen. The, fa the fan is coming up. Okay, the first one is running. Okay, so this is like the control node of my mini cluster. Um, okay. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we learned in the presentation that you need to have nodes with storage available in a volume group. So uh, we're going to use this scratch volume group. And um, let's go to a second node as well. Here's also the volume group. Okay. Then. Okay, that command um, starts a DBD managed cluster. Um, you issue the init on the first node of the cluster, that's it. Um, then Okay, so what happened here? Um, the add node command adds a second node to the DVD managed cluster, and it happened that I use, that I have my SSH key active. So the program found out, oh, there is an SSH agent in the environment, let's try to SSH to the, to the joining node and to execute the necessary commands there. Uh, if that, if that doesn't work, I can show you that as well, then you have to copy and paste this one command to the joining node. And after that, the node is joined. So node joining means it got the control volume and it got DBD setup to mirror the control volume. So um, let's look at that. 
Yeah, so here's the control volume, that's the dot dbd ctrl, and uh, status. And yeah, dbd9 has a new status command, we no longer use proc dbd, and that simply says, okay, here it is. Uh, I'm currently secondary, my local disk is up to date, I have one peer that's called v1, and it's also up to date. And I can then add more nodes, and then I would create volumes and so on. But apparently, now the break starts. So um, I can offer you who is really interested to see the rest of the demo <laughs> that you join me outside and we continue it there. Okay, yeah, and we have shirts. So if you like this t-shirt, stop by here. Uh, we have a few of them. Thank you.